Okay, great. Uh, so uh, today I, I'm going to start off the day talking about uh, polygenic scores. Um, and so this is, I think, um, in, in terms of like applied lectures, I think this is the starting point for how a lot of you will, will end up doing uh, research. This is sort of the, the, the approach that a lot of people take. And so let's talk about what a polygenic score is, um, how you build them, and maybe what some of their limitations are, um, how, how you might use them. Um, so I'm going to start off today talking about uh, a concept that, that Raymond talked about yesterday when he was talking about early score regression. I'm just going to review it really quickly. So, so you know, we have this model that we've shown you a dozen times, I'll get more than that probably, right? We have the phenotype Y, and there's this additive component, and then everything left over. And this additive component's just a, a sum of, of the genotypes, right? Now, so, so these genotypes, um, just to be clear, for this model is, is every genetic variant. And so that's like all SNPs, rare and common, but even like indels and structural variants, it should include like all of these linear additive sorts of things. And, and all of those things put together, if we want to know how much they contribute to the phenotype, that gives us the, the narrow sense heritability. Right? So that's, that's kind of where, where we've started. Um, one of the tricky things, though, is when we have genome-wide data, we don't measure uh, every variant. Right? We, we only have maybe some subset K of them, and K is going to be a lot less than J um, because you know, we don't have super rare things and, and we usually don't measure the, the structural stuff. Um, and so I'm going to say, let's, let's say that these are, so, so the K are the, are the SNPs that, that we observe in our data. Right? And so this changes things a little bit. And so I'm going to talk about, introduce this concept called like the additive SNP factor. And so this is just the best linear predictor of the observed SNPs um, for the phenotype that we're interested in. And so um, in, in this case, so, so in that case, I'm, I'm using this little b to correspond to uh, the, 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 the weights that, you, that get assigned to each of the SNPs for, for the subset. And so that's different. I think that Raymond in his lecture, he called that beta star. And I tried to go through and change all of mine to beta stars last night. Um, but then they were like beta star hat tilde, so, like it got confusing. And so I've just, I'm using little b here, but, um, but you can remember that that's, that's, that's what that is. And so these little b's are going to be um, a little different than, than the betas um, because these, these little b's may, may involve some tagging, right? So, so if we have a SNP that we observe next to a SNP that we don't observe because we just didn't measure it or we didn't impute it, um, then, then all of a sudden, this, this little b may incorporate signals for the things that, that we don't see. Is, is that clear? So, so all of a sudden, these, these, these little b's don't have the same causal interpretation that our betas had originally. These are kind of the best, uh, best predictor. It's, it's a projection into the subset of, of SNPs. Okay? Um, and so, great. Now, so now we have this, this uh, additive factor for SNPs. And so we can you know, re-express everything with uh, you know, a SNP, which is just the sum across our observed, um, our observed SNPs, and then the residual that's left over um, just from the subset of SNPs. Okay? And so then this gives us a, a, a new notion of heritability. So we already talked about broad heritability, which is the effect of like, all, all genetic factors and every combination and interactions and things like that. That's broad. We have narrow, which is... Um, the linear effects, we're going to fit that into a linear model, but all variants. And now we have the, the SNP heritability, which is the, the amount of variation that's explained by the, by the SNPs in our model. And so for, for SNP heritability, how is that going to compare um, in magnitude to the narrow heritability that we have? Is it going to be bigger? Yeah? It's going to be smaller. It's going to be smaller. Why smaller? Yeah, it's a subset of, of the SNPs, and so we, you know, we can't explain as much variation. So is, is, this, is this going to be, so, so if we took the, let's pretend that we had like a, a, a not SNP heritability, and we said how much variation is explained by the SNPs that we don't observe, right? Is, um, is that going to be um, one, you know, the, the, the additive heritability, like the, the narrow heritability minus this? That's maybe not a super clear question, but the point that I'm trying to get at is even though we don't observe SNPs, our SNP heritability will capture um, uh, the explanatory power of the things that we don't observe due to things like LD, right? So, so this narrow heritability, you know, we may only have a very small subset of SNPs, but as long as those SNPs are tagging um, SNPs that we don't observe, 
um, then you know, we still may think that we're capturing that kind of variation. So you know, the SNP heritability doesn't include indels. It doesn't com um, include copy number variants in, in the actual, like you know, how we've written it out here. But it may actually include variation because of those things, um, because, uh, because of LD between the things that we observe and the things that we don't. All right. So that's a, something to keep in mind. And this is the point that we just made. He SNP heritability is going to be um, less than or equal to the, the narrow sense heritability. OK, so you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that, that we can estimate SNP heritability. Um, Raymond talked to us yesterday about uh, LD score regression, which is one way that we can estimate it if we have summary statistics. I think we've thrown the word Gremel out um, all over the place. So that's a, a way you can estimate heritability if you have individual level data. And I think Alex is going to talk a bit more about Gremel um, when he lectures uh, next week. Um, but uh, um, so if we, uh, things to, you know, in terms of like how we should think about, you know, what is, what is this uh, number, the SNP heritability, and why is it useful? Um, we're going to talk about why, but, but first point is that it's an upper bound on, on how, uh, by, by the total, wait, it's an upper bound on the total predictive power of SNP. Yeah. Um, so so if, we, if we think like how, how much, you know, if we made a combination of, of SNPs, how much possibly could it ever, ever explain? How much is variation? And, and it's that. You know, for, for any possible linear combination of these SNPs, um, this is as good as we can get. Um, and it's a lower bound on the narrow heritability. So if we want to say, well, how much is the narrow heritability? Well, it's going to be um, at least as big as what we measure for the SNP heritability. So, so we know the narrow heritability is going to be larger than, than what we estimate the SNP heritability to be. Um, if, we, if we had sequencing data, and we measured every genetic variant, and including all of these like non kind of SNP sorts of things. Um, the SNP heritability of, of that data set uh, would be equal to the narrow heritability because we've measured everything. Yes. Uh, which sequence do you locate the upper bound? This one here. Yeah. So so the the idea is um, let's let's say that we had that set of SNPs, and I wanted to you know predict the the phenotype. Um, you know, and so I assign weights to everything, and maybe I just choose some arbitrary sets of weights that aren't based on anything at all. The best I can possibly do for any set of weights in terms of predicting the phenotype is, is what we get out of the SNP heritability. We can never do better than that because it's defined that way. It's the best linear predictor, and so any other set of weights will be worse. Um, okay, so SNP heritability, we talked about, I mean, I, I get a brief overview. So, so there's a, a big class of methods using molecular level data like Gremel and, and LDAC. Um, you know, there's a bunch of summary statistic based methods like LD score regression, or Summer is kind of a new paper that came out that's based on summary statistics. And so these are, you know, a mil million ways to try to get at this, um, this parameter. Um, some of them share assumptions, some are distinct. Most of the differences between these um, have to do with what we assume about the distribution of the effect sizes. Right? We, we need to make some assumption about what distribution they're drawn from, and based on what assumptions we make, that, that determines what the difference is between these, these different kinds of methods. And so there's, there's a, like a really nice summary in, um, I think it's Matt Keller's paper, um, about these different methods and, and what different assumptions are needed for each of them. So that's, I think, on your reading list. Um, so just to, as an example, if we wanted to um, you know, calculate the SNP heritability in our data, um, here, here's some, some examples. So like for height, it's 50-ish it's percent. Um, BMI and EA, you get numbers around 20. Subjective well-being, we're, we're 9%. Um, age at first birth, we're at 15. And so you know, that's kind of the realm of where the, the SNP heritabilities live. Um, so in general, these numbers, again, we saw they're, they're smaller. They're, they're often, you know, like even, even half to a third as big as, as the, the narrow sense heritability. So, so what are the reasons that, um, that the SNP heritability um, might be less? You know, well, like, first off, uh, oh, not, not, what determines the difference, I mean, between the SNP heritability and, uh, and the narrow sense heritability? What are the factors that, um, that describe this big difference? Well, this is sometimes thought about like the, mis the missing heritability problem, right? It's how, 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 what's the difference between SNP and the narrow sense? Well, you know, we already talked about this. We don't have all the SNPs. And so that's the primary thing you might think of. And so maybe that difference is because if we just had more SNPs, that would close the gap between the two, right? Um, it may also be that our additive heritability estimates are, are too large. I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday. So if there are, are non-additive effects, then that tends to bias our 
like our twin estimates upwards. And so maybe part of this gap is just due to bias in the, um, in the additive, the, the narrow sense heritability estimates. Um, but this actually um, works in, in, in the other direction. Our SNP heritability estimates may also be biased upwards due to things like assortative mating or indirect parental effects, which we're going to talk a bunch about last week. So, so these are things that may explain like, you know, the difference between them. Um, but uh, this is saying actually the difference we see, it's, it, it's probably even worse than what we're observing because um, our, our SNP heritability estimates are probably too large. Um, yeah, so we'll talk a lot about this next week. This is actually a really important point. Okay, so you know we've been talking about her SNP heritability. Let's let's dig into polygenic scores. Um, so you know we have our additive model um, with the SNP heritability, um, and so there's, there's this concept that we're, we're going to call the true polygenic score. Now, if 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 like the data gods came down and gifted me with these actual bees, you know, and they said here here they are, um, bless you. Uh, <laughs> then uh, you know we could we could use those bees. We'd make a polygenic score, and it would be great. We would have have you know the the ideal thing. Um, and and the variance explained by this polygenic score, like I told you already, you know, if we had these bees, the variance explained by the polygenic score is going to be the the SNP heritability. This is great. We're all very very happy. Um, but the problem is we don't know um, what these bees are, right? Um, we don't, we don't have our data gods, we just have data. And so we, we can maybe get estimates of these, of these bees from, from maybe like a GWAS or something like that. And so when we say polygenic scores, we're usually referring to a sum over the SNPs that we observe. And, and we're weighting them by, by something that we think corresponds to these like ideal bees that we wish we had. Right? So this is when we say true polygenic score, it's the ideal thing. Polygenic score, which we're going to call a hat snip, it's the estimated thing. Yeah, yeah. So this goes goes back to this idea of um, you know we don't have excuse me we don't have all of the snips, um, and so let's say that we had two causal snips that were in perfect LD, right? Um, but we don't observe one of them. That signal from this one here is going to be absorbed into its neighbor. And so, you know, so it'll, this, this SNP will try to take the role of both of these put together. And so it'll be a little different due to these kinds of reasons. Yes? And when we have, when we say, like, ASNPI, are we talking about a specific SNP? Like, I corresponds to what? I is an individual. So, so this, is the, this is the additive factor for, for a person I. The SNP here is it's not corresponding to a specific SNP. It's just saying this is of SNPs mm -hmm. to, to distinguish between... Um, just like all all variants. Great. Other questions? Good. I should uh, make sure I'm keeping up on time. Measured. Oh, that's what I mean. Measured SNPs or imputed. Um, okay. So 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 what's the difference between these beta hats? Well, let's um, B hats and, and and the bees. Well, let's let's pretend that we we have a, a trick that allows us to get unbiased estimates of, of these Bs, right? And so then we could decompose it as, well, B hat is true B, like the thing that we want, but plus some, some noise. And we're going to say that noise is, is mean zero, um, because hopefully we have a way to get unbiased estimators. Um, in that case, we have our, our A hat SNP, our polygenic score, is, is this thing. That's by definition. I'm going to substitute in what B hat is um, you know, it's the true thing plus the noise. And so we could then expand this out into, into two pieces, right? If we distribute this through, we'll have XB, which is, which is actually the, the true polygenic score, the true additive component from SNPs, and then, and then a, a, a noise parameter. And this noise actually is going to be um, mean zero. Um, and so, so that's nice. So, so this, this is starting to look like um, sort of classical measurement error if you're, if you're used to seeing these kinds of models. We have, we have a variable that we observe, and it's equal to the true thing that we're interested in plus, plus some noise. It means zero noise. And yes? Sorry, I just want to ask. So the, the mean zero is that, so there's expected to be no systematic biases kind of in, say, the source of SNPs that you pick up or um, because of LD scores. I'm just I'm wondering, are there ways in which systematic biases can creep in that pushes that to a non-mean zero? 
So um, we get mean zero by by claiming that our estimator is is unbiased. So so as long as as long as our um, beta hats that we have don't have systematic biases that uh, that are correlated with the true effect size, um, then then I think that we just get this for free at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if there's things like um, Stratification, at, you know, due to selection or things like that, then you might worry that these kinds of biases will um, will be correlated with your bees, um, and so I'm I'm going to pretend that's not a thing. Um, but we're actually going to talk a little bit about that, like we'll we'll talk about what happens when that's violated um, later in the slides. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so great, so so you know we're in pretty good shape. I we we have this thing that we observe a. And conditional on, on what the true thing is that we want, like the expected value of that thing is, 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 is what we want. We're happy, right? This is, this is great. It seems like it's a reasonable proxy um, for the thing that we're interested in. Okay. Um, so, so let's talk about you know, uh, maybe why, why maybe the reason we may be less happy. Because um, we want to talk about the predictive power of this observed polygenic score relative to like, the ideal predictive power, the SNP heritability. Right? And so I'm going to just go through some quick algebra. This is not super complicated. It's just a handful of steps. So, so, so imagine, oh, this should be backwards. Imagine that we regress the phenotype onto the polygenic score. Well, you know, the properties of OLS, you know, the, the, the parameter that we get in that regression is going to be the covariance of the two things divided by the variance of, of the polygenic score. Um, I'm going to substitute in this decomposition that we talked about before. For uh, the polygenic score, so you know, true additive part, part plus noise, and then this is just by definition of what our phenotype is, right. and then I'm going to also substitute in um, the polygenic score decomposition we talked about before. Well, these the, the the residual should be independent of all these other things, and so should the error as long as we're predicting into an independent sample. So as long as there's not sample overlap, you know, these two terms go away, and so we just have the covariance of a snip and a snip, which is just the variance of a snip. And then down here, these are separable, so, so it's the, vari the variance of the sum is the sum of the variance. Right? So this is, this is the parameter that you would get in, in our regression. Now we want to say what's the, um, what is the predictive power of that? Well, it's going to be, I don't think I actually wrote this math out on this next slide. Oh, no, I did. OK, so it's good. So, so if we want to say what's the, what's the predictive power of the polygenic score? Well, it's the, this parameter squared times the variance of the polygenic score divided by the total variance of the phenotype. Okay? So we can do a bunch of substitution. I'm not going to walk through it super carefully, but if you do a bunch of math, um, you get to a thing that looks like this. Um, and, when you're, and, and this term here, you do a bunch of math that I've not included here, but you can look up in, in this paper if you'd like. Um, and, and you end up with this like, really nice, simple, simple looking thing. This is, this is the predictive power of the polygenic score as a function of the effective number of variants in your polygenic score, and the sample size that you used to calculate the polygenic score. And it's just a function of these SNPs. So, so let's do some, uh, some, some limiting cases. Um, if, if we increase n uh, infinitely, you know, we increase n to, to infinite, um, what does this thing converge to? Well, what, what happens to this term first? This goes to 0. And so then we just have this down here, and one of these will cancel out with one of these, and we're stuck with h squared SNP. So that's good news, right? Because I told you that as you increase the sample size and you get rid of all the noise, you, you approach the SNP heritability, and, and, so, and that's what we see in our formula. Um, alternatively, what if, what if n is, is uh, very small? Well, then this thing is going to be large relative to this thing, and so the denominator is going to be very large. And so we're going to have very small predictive power. And s yes? So what's the difference between n, e, and k? Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah. So, so the reason that we have a distinction here uh, is because it, um, m, e has to do with the effective number of SNPs in your sample. So if you have a bunch of SNPs that are like, closely correlated with each other in your polygenic score, um, the, the, the noise essentially cancels out. You effectively only have like one SNP because of the things that are so, that are so tightly correlated. And so if, if all of our SNPs are independent, then this would be K. But when you have SNPs that are in LD, um, you, you know, this, will, this will be smaller than K. 
Um, in genome-wide data, uh, it turns out we can estimate what K is, and it's like somewhere between 50 and 70,000. Um, so this is this is this is super powerful because now we can say you know if we know what the SNP heritability is, which we can estimate by you know all these methods that we alluded to, and you know we know how big our discovery sample is, um, and and we have estimates of, of ME hopefully. Oh yeah, huh? So what I know that we talked about this before, but what's the distinction between this this fifty to seventy thousand estimate of ME and the million independent loci that we use for the genome wide significance correction? You know, I don't, I, so, so I, I, I mean, they're both supposed to represent how many SNPs are, are, but I think, gee, I'm, I actually, I'm not exactly sure what the math is. I know that, that the relevant number of SNPs, like the correction you needed to account for LD is slightly different in the two cases. Do you know, Alex, like why, so, so the, we, we usually say there's a million independent SNPs because of the Bonferroni correction. And so we say, yeah, there's, there's a million effective. But when we do these calculations, we say that there's 50,000. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Uh, I mean, this oh, do you know what? I think you're right. I think it's a pop gen thing. That <laughs> certainly isn't the case for the million SNPs, but for this, I'm wondering if it's just like the number that are contributing to the trait, like the number of independent loci contributing to the trait. Yeah, because that's what I'm saying. There must be related genetic architecture to the yeah. predictive power of those. This number comes from looking at the variance of the off diagonal elements of the genetic relatedness matrix. That's where that number comes from. So, so it's not phenotype but specific. If it's just like one causal SNP or so there's a million. Your polyhemic score is going to be quite different. Right? No, no, no. Well, no, but no, but not if you include all of the SNPs, right? Like if you include all the SNPs, even if one's the, one is the only causal one, all of the other SNPs are still adding noise, which is going to reduce the the, the predictive power here. Right. So, so like you if you probably wouldn't construct it in that way. Well, sure, sure, yeah. I mean, but in polygenic traits where we can't identify which one's the causal one, we include them all generally, is right? This formula being empirically validated. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll look it up and get back to you. We'll look it up and get back to you. I don't, I don't know exactly why, what it is that makes this number different than like effective number of tests. But I think it's because it's a slightly different thing. We're talking about effective number of tests versus um, kind of how the noise is combining when, you, um, uh, yeah, when you're producing these scores, how much, how much noise is being created. Um, so just to give you a sense of what's happening happening here, so here's some curves corresponding to, um, you know, like traits, you know, different traits that have different level of heritability, and I've picked these numbers to correspond roughly to um, traits that we might care about. So like for height, so on the x-axis is the sample size of the discovery sample that we use to to produce the score weight, so the GWAS sample size, and these are in millions. And on the y-axis is the expected predictive power of the polygenic score, and so. Is it within sample prediction or out of sample? This is out of sample prediction. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and so as you, as you get to um, you know, really large sample sizes, you see that our predictive power is going to start approaching the maximum predictive power. So for height, it's 50% heritability. And if we had 2.5 million people, then we're, we're almost all the way to 50%. Whereas um, you know, we're, we climb a bit more slowly towards these thresholds when we have lower heritability traits. Um, I mean, I guess this, this distance looks kind of the same in all three cases, actually. But, but in terms of like relative distance, this is a you know eight percent heritability, and, and even with two and a half million, we're only getting to like six percent, so seventy five percent of the total heritability, where we're getting almost all of the heritability for height um, once we get there. So for low heritability traits, you need much larger sample sizes to get a significant portion of the of the heritability that exists. Yep. <coughs> Uh -huh. It's the same trait, no? So if you, if you look at the GWAS history and... and yeah, yeah, so I have a picture exactly like that in just a minute. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, like it, it, these, these tend to be, um, it, it's usually quite close to, to what you predict it to be once you take it out of sample. Um, okay, so let's talk about heterogeneity. So, so what if we're predicting, you know, oh, yes? The additive, yeah, the narrow sense heritability. And so, yeah, so this is the maximum it could ever possibly be if we had, you know, an infinite sample. And this is, this is how, much, how much of it that we're getting. It's the SNPs heritability, I think. Uh, 
Oh, you're right. Sorry. This is the SNP heritability. Apologies. Um, OK. So, so what if there is heterogeneity? So, so we've assumed so far that like, the, the SNP heritability everywhere is always the same, and that the Bs are always the same no matter like, what you're predicting into. But uh, you know, we might not think that that's reasonable, right? Educational attainment in the UK may be different than educational attainment um, in the US or Australia or Italy or, you know, and, and those, those differences may mean that the, um, that the little bees that we're using may not be optimal for one, for one group to the other. And so if there's heterogeneity, what's your sense of, of what's going to happen um, to the predictive power of our polygenic score if we try to port it um, across, across uh, different groups? Okay, who thinks it's going to go up because of heterogeneity? Who thinks it's going to go down? Who thinks it's uncertain? It's actually uncertain. I tricked you all. <laughs> um, so let's, let's talk, about, talk about why. Okay, so, so I'm going to say um, that uh, a, a star SNP is the additive component um, for, for phenotype Y star. So this is, this is, you know, so Y star is the phenotype in a, in a, in a different cohort, right? So we could think, uh, um, yeah, is it, so, so these ASNPs may be different. And so what that means is that ASNP a star might not be the same as ASNP in terms of the weights used to, to get there. Um, importantly, what this means is that the, the SNP heritability in our other cohort doesn't necessarily equal the SNP heritability in the prediction cohort. So those heritabilities may be different. Um, also, we have this idea called genetic correlation, which Raymond's going to talk about this afternoon. And I'm just going to you know, give you a, a we're going to define it here as the, the correlation between the um, additive factor for you know, y star and the additive factor for just y. The correlation between these two things I'm going to call rg. And so if the two traits are very similar, rg will equal to 1. But if in the two, if in the two cohorts, um, you know, the optimal betas are, are very different, then rg will be smaller. And so in that case, the, the, you know, we do a bunch of math, and we get this formula here. And so we see rg here. And so I think this is what you are all thinking about with your intuition of like, oh, is, is rg going to go up or down? You know, because this thing is bounded above by 1. And so if, if the rg is smaller because the, the trait is a little bit different genetically, then this will depress the predictive power in the new cohort. Um, but we see here that this, the, we have an h squared star here, which is the SNP heritability in the other cohort. So if we're predicting into a cohort where um, it's more heritable, uh, where, where, the, where the trait is more heritable, that's actually going to inflate the r squared. And so, so it may be that, you know, once we predict into a, a, a second cohort, we do a, a lot better than, than we would have done if we kind of stayed within our, within our own sample. Are we assuming that LG structure is the same across the population? Uh, um, yes. Yes, I think you need LD structure to be the same. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, so LD is the same. You know, they have the same sort of ancestral back background, but maybe the institutions are different, which means that the pathways that these SNPs are going through may be slightly different. Yeah, and Alicia's going to talk all about that in just a minute. And, and I think that's the primary reason when you go across ancestries why it doesn't work. But, but even if within an ancestry across, uh, you know, across cohorts, um, like over time or, or even you know, similar in ancestry but you know, different, different institutional backgrounds, it also could be different. Mm -hmm. What if RG is negative? That formula wouldn't be valid, would it? Because then you'd have a negative R squared. That's a good question. It might be RG squared. I'll have to double check. Um, I'll have to double check. Good point. Um, hmm. uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll look that up and, and fix it because, uh, yeah, that doesn't make sense. R squared can't be negative. <laughs> um, OK, and here's, here's a, a, a side point, which, which, you know, so I talked about it being the same trait but in different cohorts. Like, the same formula will actually apply if you think about, like, different traits within the same cohort. We have, you know, um, so uh, you might have, like, educational attainment and cognitive performance, right? And so in those cases, the additive factor may have different heritabilities and imperfect genetic correlation, and this thing still holds. If we, if we create a polygenic score 
for educational attainment and then try to predict cognitive performance with that score, this, this formula governs what the expected predictive power is. And, and this actually is, is something is people, people noticed pretty early on that if you took the EA score from, from one of the EA GWASs and you tried to predict cognitive performance in a different sample, you were getting um, you know, R squareds that were, were even bigger than what we were seeing for education and people thought that that was like crazy. But the reason, the reason, that, um, the reason that you're seeing bigger R squareds predicting a different phenotype is, is primarily driven by the fact that the heritability of cognitive performance is higher than the heritability of education. And so that's, that's why you can actually see better when you, when you switch traits. Okay, how am I, I'm supposed to go till 1040? Is that right? Okay, great. Um, I'm, I may skip this in that case. So, so um, just, a, just a brief point, I won't go into detail here. Um, so when we do these regressions, it's attenuating our, our um, estimates, right? And so, so if we want to know like what's the actual effect of, of the SNP um, additive factor, um, you know, we're getting something that's too small because of this noise thing and the attenuation due to noise in our, in our estimates, in our B estimates, right? Um, additionally, when we have the polygenic scores, we, we often standardize them to have variance one. And so there's a funny standardization that happens that I didn't talk through in the theory here. So we're, we're, we're essentially shrinking um, the variance of the additive component in, in that case as well due to the standardization. And that makes the units a bit funny. And then especially, this becomes especially hard if we say, let's take a polygenic score in, um, you know, from, an, uh, from a GWAS and you know, 100,000 people and do some analysis. And then let's take a different polygenic score in, in 400,000 people and do the same analysis as before. And, and these results aren't really comparable because the units of the score are different due to the way that we're scaling and the amount of attenuation. And so there, there are, are things that you, you might consider doing to try to get your results in the units of the, of the true score. Um, and I'm not gonna dig into that a ton right now, but if there's time at the end, we can come back to it. But that's just a, a, something to keep in mind is that as, as the scores change, these results are not comparable for a couple of reasons. Okay, great. So, you know, one of the great things about the polygenic score, so, you know, we talked about candidate gene studies and using like one gene at a time or, or GWAS, which is looking at like one SNP at a time. Um, and one huge advantage of polygenic scores over these genetic variants is that they're, they're much more powerful. Remember the average R squared of a single SNP for educational attainment was something like on the order of 0.02% R squared or, you know, something like that, where we're getting R squareds of 12% of for education. Um, you know, and so, so we can see that for, uh, for height, you know, for, for, for height, even though the SNP heritability is 50%, the polygenic score based on Wood et al. is like 14%. For BMI, we're at seven. As the sample sizes for EA have gone up, our polygenic scores have gotten more and more predictive. Um, but you know, all, all, of these, all of these numbers are much bigger than the single SNP numbers we were showing before. Um, here's, here's the figure that, um, uh, uh, that we were talking about earlier. Um, where we can, we can plot here on the, on the x-axis the sample size of the discovery sample. And here's the R squared. And we have two samples here. We have ad health, which is up here, and we have HRS, which is here. And you can see it, it tracks you know, um, pretty well. Uh, well, I mean, I guess I don't have the, the line of what you'd expect it to be. If I were to plot the, um, the line from the Detweiler formula that I, that I showed up, it actually follows these numbers um, pretty well. And especially if you use the devlaming where you're accounting for perhaps cross-cohort heterogeneity, then it fits even better. And so, so, the, so these numbers are, are acting exactly as, as, as we'd expect. Um, okay, so I said that we had these little bees um, and that you know, they're unbiased and that's, and that's great. Um, and, and I think that you all realize these come from, from GWAS data, but um, I hadn't said that yet. So here's a slide telling you that they come from GWAS. Um, and so, uh, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll run a GWAS um, in, in a really large sample to get these bees, and then we can take these polygenic scores into small samples. And so here's just something to, to tell you about. You know, remember for GWAS, we needed hundreds of thousands of people to get reliable results. Well, the polygenic score, if, if the R squared of the polygenic score is 7%, like it is for BMI, um, then you, know, you have 80% power to detect an effect even in just a sample of like 100 people. 
So that's pretty good. If we're at 9%, then we can do it in like 85, per, you know, we have 80% power in a, in a sample of 85 people. And so all of a sudden, this is like valuable for individual researchers who want to, to do stuff in the samples they have available. You don't need a million people to do genetics, re social science genetics research. You know, you can use the, the samples that are available to us and, and sample sizes that we have that have kind of better measures and more robust, um, you know, uh, robust measures over time and, you know, careful things like that. Um, can we hold that even if the odds curve is obviously 1%? Well, so this number is different if it's 1%. Yeah. Um, I mean, but 1% but still is much bigger than 0.02%. You know, so I mean, at 1%, how, uh, you probably need, what's your best guess, David? He's usually has better intuition about these sorts of things. For power, how, what do you need? 80% power, 1% R squared, 5,000? Lower. Much lower? lower? Yeah, I'm gonna go, I was going to say 1,000, but somebody should look it up online. Yeah. I don't have you could do the calculation, but you know, yeah. it's still, it's not hundreds of thousands. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, this, this, it's, it's still smaller than like the size of the health and retirement study. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm going to revise my estimates even lower before Dan tells us it's, it's yeah. even more hundreds. Okay. <laughs> Um, on, a, on a practical note for these um, researchers, um, if, the, if the cohorts that, that uh, I as an individual researcher are going to be predicting into are different than the sort of prediction cohorts that we've used in the GWAS or the discovery cohorts, um, then I don't know the R squared PGS. And if I'm thinking about the effective sample size, the, the sample size that I need to get a certain amount of power, I, I probably shouldn't be conditioning on the R squared PGS from Ad Health or HRS. Yeah, I mean, so, so I mean, we have this formula here, right? So this one's a little bit better. So this is the predictive power in a different court. So if we made assumptions about what we think the RG is between the two cohorts, and, and then we you know, maybe have a best guess of what the relative heritability is in the two cohorts, then we still can do a power calculation here, um, taking those things into account. Yeah, I mean, so I think there's a little bit um, just experience. I mean, we know that the SNP heritability in Ad Health and HRS are, are bigger than in like the UK Biobank, um, and so like now that we know that, if we're trying to think about follow-up work that we might do, at least for ed yeah educational attainment, that's the case. I mean, whenever you have to do these power calculations, at, at some point you just have to think like. You know what's reasonable based on other research that I've seen that's as, as close as possible to the research that I've done. Um, this is just generally a, a a bit of an art. I mean, you know, you would. Uh, you know, I think rules of thumb is pick things that you think are reasonable, but also things that you think are like worst case scenarios, and and try to think about how how bad it would be if it's the worst case scenario and you didn't gather enough data, um, you know, and, and make judgment calls like that. Do you have thoughts about kind of power calculations when we don't actually know these parameters and we just have to kind of guess at them? I mean, you should, you should do your best to guess and think about range, plausible ranges and, mm -hmm. you know, the most analogous kind of other situations that you can think of. That This paper that I, that I referred to on my slide that that I think is actually an optional reading. This Gelman and Carlin yeah. has some nice examples in a diff non genetics context, but of how you could go about doing power calculations when no one has ever done the study before. Yeah, so you just do the best you can. Um, I mean, like, you know, if you do it wrong, then you're just going to be punished by by data the, the what? Data gut. Data gut. Oh, the data gods. You also can just, you'll be punished by the data gods. <laughs> that's right. Beware, beware of self-serving over-optimism. Yeah, that's right. So in, in general, you want to be, be conservative if you can. I think it's worth talking about data gods. I myself sure don't have much use on this data, but I think it's explained why we have such a major difference between SNP, SNP heritability and heritability estimated for R squared and PGS. Yeah, so, so, so this goes back to this idea of uh, the, the PGS that we have is, you know, if, if we had the true PGS from the data gods, um, then this is what we would get. But what we have is true PGS plus a bunch of noise. 
And so that noise means there's a lot of variation in our PGS, which isn't telling us anything about our phenotype. It's just there because of estimation error. And so that's generally going to, to decrease the predictive power because we can't distinguish between variation that's due to like real stuff and variation just due to the, the noise um, from estimating. Well, it's a comment because when you were showing the formula for speed traceability, you said that it depends on the species preferences, how the fluids that are passing the species are traced. I was wondering why can't we create glycemic scores based on those fluids? Would we not have a higher variance explained by yeah. the species? Yeah, so it's, it's, if it's not um, like, it's not that there are like 50 SNPs that are the right SNPs. It's that um, it's, it's just a, a, a number that we have which, which corresponds to, um, you know, like how, how many SNPs are equivalent. So, so, you know, it's, it's not that there are 50,000 SNPs that we could just pick out, but having the, you know, a million SNPs that we have um, from the perspective of, of doing prediction. And, and how much our, our results will be attenuated, it's equivalent to having 50,000 independent SNPs. Like, so, so it's just, it's, it's an, it's a, that number is just supposed to be an equivalence sort of a thing and not, not necessarily about uh, identifying the specific SNPs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just an answer to the 1% question. Oh. question is 80% power with 780 people. Oh, wow, yeah, see, I'm always way off. This is why I asked David. <laughs> What do you? Like between the phenotype and the score? Mm -hmm. Like between HRS or even echo, it's not experimental studies, so we can make sure if you're studying something, you typically want to get a more complex model and get more predictive things. Yeah, yeah. So, so it does get more complicated if the model that you want to test includes other covariates or if you want to interact the score with like other, other things. Um, I, I think that knowing what the baseline predictive power is is helpful sure. um, because you know if it's more predictive then no matter what setting you're talking about it's it's going to do better um, than, than otherwise and so you should you know you should uh, keep in mind that like like any time you add covariates to the to the model you know that, that might have might affect these calculations in in your head um, I I don't know that and so I mean it's super setting specific but yes. Yeah, that's true. So this is this is how much power you need to detect the specific. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's a that's a good point. But like, I mean, I think that there are simple analyses where they just take a polygenic score and they predict some phenotype, um, and uh, and and for those these work. But then for more complicated models, you need to to be a bit do more careful power calculations. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So. Um, Okay, so I told you, like, you know, we have these bees, and I said they exist, the, these, these, uh, so, so we have these bee hats that exist, and they come from GWAS. So the problem with these, um, with GWAS, it, well, okay, why is, why is it a problem? What, what's the difference between the GWAS bees that we observe and the bee hats that we want to have? How do, how do we get the GWAS summary statistics, and how is it different from this thing that we're aiming for? Well, what is what is a GWAS estimate like? What does it come? What's the model that we use to get it? That's exactly right. You know, so so I mean, I told you the difference between beta and little b was that you know there are SNPs that are omitted, and therefore you know this SNP will will predict some of the stuff from the the omitted variant. Um, and then this is more, an even more extreme version. When we do a GWAS, we're only doing one SNP at a time. And so that SNP's going to um, borrow information from everything that's in LD, even things that we observe. And so, um, so if we build our score using the GWAS beta, what happens is we might get like double counting. So imagine that we observe two SNPs that are in high LD. Well, in the GWAS summary statistic, this SNP is going to capture the signal from, from both, because they're in LD. And this SNP is going to capture the signal from both because they're in LD. And so then we throw them both into a polygenic score, and they're both capturing the signal from both. And, and uh, what that means is we're going to double count these regions. So regions where there's high LD, we're going to put way too much weight. 
because every SNP is double, triple, you know, even more than that counting um, information. And so we want to do some sort of correction. So, so we see the problem with this is LD, and we want to have some correction that accounts for that. Um, and yes? When, when we're trying to find lead SNPs, that's what we do. So if we want to say, like, how many lead SNPs there are, then, you know, we'll do this procedure of, of picking the one that has the highest p-value. Um, but, you know, but we have summary statistics for, for all measured SNPs. And so, you know, we may want to, the model that I showed you here didn't have any sort of selection. I said this is just all the observed SNPs, including ones that are outside of the GWAS peak. What's the right way to do it? Yeah, that's a great question. This is what we're going to, this is what we're going to talk about next. Okay. So, um, so there's a handful of ways that, that you, might, um, you might fix it. Um, so, so the first one is, is a pruning and, and thresholding approach. And so the pruning and thresholding is, is closely related to this thing that we just talked about. So, so what you do here is you start off, at, well, essentially you, you do the pruning, the, the, the clumping algorithm that ISU described. We take the SNP that has the very lowest p-value, and we say, okay, we're going to keep this one because we think that it's important. And we set that aside, but then we just remove every SNP that's in LD with that SNP, uh, you know, to some threshold. And then we take the remaining SNPs and we, um, you know, take the next lowest p-value, and we do that until we meet some p-value threshold that we pick. And so that threshold could be, uh, you know, one. Like we could just keep doing this until we run out of SNPs, or we could go until genome-wide significance, or you know, pick whatever threshold we think is reasonable and just use those SNPs. And so we'll set a weight of zero for everything that uh, we pruned out, and, and we'll use the GWAS weight for the things that we keep. And so this is, um, this is quite common to see this. And there, there are a bunch of methods that will automate this. Precise is a, a program that maybe some of you have seen that, that do this automatically across a variety of thresholds and things. Um, there's a problem with this, though. Um, what's going to be, what's, um, wh what might be the downside of, of an approach like this? Exactly, yeah. And so like, imagine that there are two SNPs that both have like, a, a true independent signal, but they have a, a correlation between the SNPs of like, 0.1, right? Um, if 0.1 is your, is your pruning threshold for LD, you'll end up throwing away that second SNP, and that's sad because maybe that SNP has a lot of important information. And so you know, it, it may be that you worry about this sort of pruning approach throws that information. In practice, it doesn't seem like you lose that much information by doing this. Um, but, but that is something that you may, you may worry about. Um, yeah, so, so it, it may reduce the R-squared PGS because you're, you're reducing the number of SNPs. Yes? So when you do this pruning procedure, does the SNP say that you keep it at the peak that you are keeping adjusted for how large is the RGPS? No, it's not because, so, so um, the GWAS beta um, is capturing the total signal of that SNP and everything that's in LD, right? And so you wouldn't want to adjust it because it's already um, like the right size given the SNPs that you're kicking out because um, because they're in LD with it, right? And so so you know if if it's in um, if it's in perfect LD with another SNP, then you know let's say that the effect of each of these SNPs is exactly one and they're in perfect LD, the GWAS coefficient of this thing is going to be two because it's going to capture both. Um, and so, so things, things kind of balance out in the right way. Um, something you could also do, which no one actually does this, but I'm just to put it up here because we talked about this um, briefly. You could use something like Kojo. So let's say you're worried about these secondary signals and you don't want to throw them out because, you know, like just because they're in like they, there's low LD between them, if there's a true signal between them, you know, you could maybe do something like Kojo and then just keep them both. Um, this is computationally kind of hard, and it doesn't really add a whole lot in, in practice. And so I, I don't know anyone who actually, like, I don't know anyone who does this. But it's a thing you could do if you wanted. Um, this, there's, then there's a whole class of, of Bayesian approaches, and this is actually my favorite. Um, you know, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what these are. So these are things like LDPRED, or there's a new method called PRSCS. Um, and so, so the idea behind these Bayesian approaches is we're going to start in like a random effects framework. And, and what we want as weights is we're going to, you know, we're assuming that the little b's are, are random variables. And what we want to know is what's the expected value of little b given our GWAS b's and, and the LD patterns that, that we observe, right? So like intuitively, 
this is exactly the right thing because you know we can use our Bayesian approach and say, oh well, given our data, what do we think the right thing is? And so this this, this equation here is exactly why I kind of like these approaches the best. It just seems from an intuitive perspective exactly what what we'd want it to be, right? Um, and so then by Bayes' rule, we can you know write out things this way, and so we have the likelihood function, which which shouldn't be too complicated. We can calculate what that is. Um, but we do have a prior here that we need to pick. Um, and depending on what prior we use, to, you know, that's, that's, that's the difference between the, the, the two Bayesian methods that, that I just mentioned and, and other Bayesian methods that may exist. There's this um, approach called like Anapred and um, different, different kinds of things. But, but the, the assumptions of the prior determine the, what the different kind of Bayesian method is. Um, so, so the two main ones that I, th I think people, well, okay, this is the main one that you see because this has long been um, the, the approach that, that you know, is, is very big. So you'll see LD, you always see people talking about LDPred versus pruning and thresholding. So LDPred assumes the spike and slab prior, or ga sometimes it's Gaussian, but Gaussian is just a, a, a special case. And so they say, well, there's some probability pi um, that the, the, the effect of, of the SNP is exactly zero. So it's, you know, a SNP that we just doesn't, doesn't have any effect on the outcome. And there's a probability one minus pi, like otherwise we think that the effect sizes are normally distributed. Okay? Um, so if we say that pi is equal to, to zero, then this is just Gaussian, right? Because it's never going to be here. And so, so the Gaussian model is a special case of this. And, and once we have this prior, we can pass it through like our, our complicated Bayesian machinery and get our posterior distributions. Um, there's a method that just came out that I, I, I really like. Um, it's, it's this, it's, it's, it's oh, I, should I complain about, yeah, it's poorly named, PRSCS. Like, who named that? Um, <laughs> So, so this is quite complicated, right? So in this case, the prior says, okay, well, we're going to assume that the betas are normal, but the variance of the normal is going to be, um, you know, some, some scaling parameter times something else, another parameter, which is random. And that parameter is a gamma distribution. But one of the parameters of the gamma distribution is also, we're going to put a distribution on that too. And so, so this, this, this prior is what, like... What's phi? Is that a constant phi? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a scale parameter. That, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so so you look at it and you're like, why why would you do this? This looks awful. Um, but there's a handful of reasons why why um, this is better better than this. Um, primarily computational reasons. It turns out that doing your um, like MCMC approaches to get the posterior distributions from this model because it's a mixture distribution is really hard. And in fact, LD Pred. Um, uh, doesn't ever converge. I think it, if, if you know anything about kind of Bayesian, um, like MCMC, I think it just has like a, a 60 iteration burn in and like stops after 100 or something like that. You know, it's much lower than you And the reason they have to do that is because otherwise this would just be way too, uh, you know, if, if you did a traditional levels of burn in, um, it, it would just take days and days and days and days. And so, um, but hopefully it gets us at least into the right neighborhood. And it often does. LD Pred does very well. Um, whereas if you have this continuous thing rather than kind of this discontinuous mixture distribution, um, you can often get distributions that approximate this, but it's very, very fast. You know, you can do you know, a, thousand, a thousand replications um, and, and get like really clean posterior distributions that you can be confident have converged. Yeah? So when you say like it does well and does bad, you mean like in predictive power? Yeah, yeah. So I'm talking predictive power relative to something like pruning and thresholding, or relative to what we'd anticipated be from Detweiler, you know, stuff like that. Uh huh. Sorry. Um, just wondering. So, given that your base, your your uh, B sub J is, is conditional on the LD matrix, do any of these models actually assume some kind of a contribution of the LD structure? Like basically, because the way I see it right now, there are certain. Um, probability distributions for these random variables, but there's no content in there about the local LD structure of the SNP. You're talking about like the randomness, like, like because we're estimating LD? Right, so in other words, I'm trying to say, are, is there any constraint placed on the parameters that are drawn from something like that based on the fact uh, of a local kind of LD structure that these SNPs are in? So I'm not sure I totally, so, so unless, you're, unless you mean, are we taking into account the randomness, but it doesn't sound like that's what you're no, saying. No, you take into account the LD structure. Like well, yeah, condition. well, no, and that's exactly what we're doing, right? And so the point of these kinds of approaches is rather than to just drop things in LD, we're going to take into account that, that um, 
you know, if we have two SNPs that are in pretty high LD um, and they're near each other, then we know that there's signal sharing between them and we say, okay, well then, what's our best guess for the signal that's here and the signal that's here given the LD patterns that we observe? But, but the, I think the point, if I understood, is that you, the distribution of B does not depend on its LD. Oh, right? yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, um, Yeah, yeah. For, I mean, for these two methods, I, that's not the case. It, it just assumes they're independent. I'm trying to think if you could do that. You know, there, there's like Anapred is a method that allows the distribution, like the variance, to vary by by characteristics of the SNP. And so I guess you could put in like an annotation for the LD if you wanted to try to take something like that into account. Yeah, because that's the issue. I mean, you estimate you have mean reference samples. But do you allow the variance of the betas to change based on the LD? Like, like if, if a SNP has a high LD score, so this, um, then, then does, that change, does that affect the distribution of the Bs? And I, and I, I don't think that it does um, in, in kind of baseline LD pred. Yeah, so if, if um, you know, to the degree to that's important, which it, it may be, um, you could maybe do better by even taking that kind of information into account. So is, this is actually just, it's, um, I, I don't have time to talk about why. It's, it's because this, there's a cute relationship between, um, so, so, so the, the idea is that one of the parameters um, controls how much you shrink things that are small, and, and, the, and the other one affects kind of how much you like, don't allow large things to, to shrink. And so if you want to get like, full flexibility, um, this, this gets you there. There's also, it's, uh, I don't have time and I have more things I would, I'd rather yeah, cover, yeah, yeah. but there's, there's some cute relationships between this and the amount of shrinkage there is and the relationship between gamma distri uh, beta distributions. Beta distributions show up whenever you, do, like, they're great. Uh, they're like, uh, yeah, they arrive whenever, like, you need help. It's great. So PRSPS is more accurate than faster? It, yeah, so it's, it's definitely, well, I think that it's, uh, it runs in comparable, comparable amounts of time, but the MCMC has thousands of, of um, uh, of iterations versus like just the hundred that LD Pred does, um, and and in the paper they show that PRSCS does at least as well as LD Pred um, in in all the cases they looked at and sometimes better. Um, and so actually, so we're going to teach you in the in the TA session. We're not even going to teach you LD Pred. We're teaching you PRSCS this week. But you know you could learn. You'll see LD Pred. Lots of people use LD Pred. One of the problems here too is this code base is not well maintained. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not very clean, and whereas this, this, this code is a lot cleaner, it's a bit easier to work with, and so I, you know, I, I, I think that this will, this will, you'll find this um, easier and make your life better. But in maybe you're going to show that, but in practice, like, can you tell us something about like, the predictive power of the, the different methods? Like, yeah, yeah, so, so if you want to look up the PRSCS paper, I'm not going to talk about this um, here today, but they do show like for different phenotypes and across different simulations how well a score based on this method does compared to pruning and thresholding and LE pred and a handful of other things. Oh, where we talk about like ten percent to eleven or like ten to fourteen. It's not much, so it, it, this isn't going to like double your predictive power. So all of all of these improvements are pretty small, which is why like you know we're making a big deal about all these different things, like. I, I like the Bayesian approaches because they tend to do a little better, but mostly because I think, you know, like it has this nice, like theoretically it seems like this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But in practice, if someone says, I'm going to do pruning and thresholding and they like, really want to, like I don't push back too hard because the scores are going to be like almost perfectly correlated. They're going to be quite close. So, you know, do, do what you like, but, you know, but do this. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but like, yeah. Ultimately, I, I don't, I, I, I don't go to like big battles over this because I don't think it makes a big difference. But it can make a, a, a small difference. It's like five, five percent, not percentage points, yeah. five percent <laughs> improvement. Um, okay, so in the in the last, I'm, I'm not even going to talk about these applications probably because we're going to talk a lot about applications next week. Um, but let's talk about potential uses and limitations uh, really quick. Um, some of these may be familiar. Um, so, so like. So here, here, here are a bunch of applications. But one thing that you may want to do with um, polygenic scores is identify correlates of genetic factors. So you, know, you may want to create a polygenic score for um, BMI and see how well it predicts uh, you know, some other outcome. And uh, you, know, you could do, um, do I have mediation as, uh, is that part of here too? 
I think that I, I included like mediation analyses here. If we want to try to understand the pathways of how these genetic factors influence these, these different approaches, you know, we might think that a PRS um, could be good and, and, and shed some light on those kinds of things. Um, so you, know, you, you might see people trying to use uh, PRSs to identify causal effects, doing things like MR. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about limitations. I'll talk more in limitations about doing that, but that is something you'll see. People will use a PRS for um, some outcome and then use that to look at the effect of that outcome on uh, some exposure on, on some other outcome later. Um, if, yeah, this is, this is a little bit problematic, but you'll, you'll, you'll see this, and in some applications it's maybe okay. Um, you could look at treatment effect heterogeneity. So you might want to say, like, what's the effect of education on health for people who are at like high risk of poor health versus low risk for poor health. Um, or, um, you know, and so here's, here's two examples that did this kind of thing. But you could use polygenic scores to try to identify um, the heterogeneous effect of the environment on, on another outcome based on a person's genetic risk. Um, this is like the least sexy version, but maybe the most powerful thing. You could just use it as a control variable, right? So, so our, the standard error on, on an estimator if you, if you, re, you know, remember this formula, it was on the board before. Um, well, the, the variance of you know, some parameter is, is equal to the, the variance of the residual in the model um, you know, and variance of, of whatever thing you're testing. But, but the variance of the residual um, is a function of, of your covariates, right? If we, if we have a lot of covariates that explain a lot of the variation, then the variance of the residual goes down. And so these, these polygenic scores are starting to explain a big chunk of the variation. And so we might think that this is a powerful way to tighten our standard errors. Um, and so that's. Um, that's right. Um, so, yeah, so as a control variable is um, great. You could do it as, a, as a, a balance test. So, let's say that you're doing like a randomized trial. Um, and you want to look at, at the you know, treated and untreated group, you could look at the polygenic scores, which are you know, determined before the, the trial. Um, and if you see differences in the mean polygenic score, or just generally in the distribution of polygenic scores between the treated and the untreated group, then that's a signal for you that, that maybe um, these, you know, your, your control group isn't actually a good control group. And so this is a, a powerful way to do those kinds of things. Um, you know, this is, this is more of a, a policy lever, and this is more like up in the air, like maybe someday. If, if, if we have polygenic scores and we think that they're very good, you can maybe identify at-risk individuals. And so, you know, if we, if we know, um, especially for things that are good if you intervene early, like maybe dyslexia or, or Alzheimer's, if we can identify people who are, who are at risk of, of these conditions and so that we can monitor them and intervene early if, if we start noticing something like that, then, you know, you maybe might think that polygenic scores are valuable in those kinds of settings, too. Mm -hmm. I, I think I've seen um, Gelman uh, speak with caution about using uh, too many control variables in, um, in some of these RCT type setups, but I can't remember exactly what I, in, in the sort of, not limiting case, but in the extreme case, why can't I include like 10 polygenic scores and all of their interactions if I have a large enough sample next to my uh, randomized treatment? Like, it, 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 what, what's the limit to these things? I, I, I don't know. What, have you heard? I mean, in theory, it shouldn't matter other than you're losing degrees of freedom every time you add a thing. But I, I don't. As long as the polygenic score, like if, if you're actually randomly assigned, and so it's not correlated with, with uh, assignment, um, the cost is one degree of freedom for every thing that you add. Uh huh. But it's not the polygenic score. It's not just a description of your genome. It's a description of the relationship between your genome and an outcome. Yeah. In that sense, it's really like pre-treatment. So my, my question is like the gene, like the polygenic score is capturing not just the gene configuration, but the gene configuration and interaction with the environment and your outcome. So if you use that control variable, you're actually like blocking some mediation of your treatment effect in, that, in some sense, as long as the process that mediates the effect in your original study from which you took your beta is related to the process that you are trying to study. No, I mean, I guess I'm trying to think of how, how it would affect the interpretation. I mean, I have a pretty simple model in, in my mind where the scores are just totally independent of, um, 
you know, of, of assignment and the treatment. And so, so you know, if we, if we want to interpret, like, what's the effect of this intervention on the individual, um, having, having things that are independent of, of the intervention, I, I don't think... Um, I don't think should affect the interpretation, like if it's truly independent and, and so because you're actually randomly assigning people. Um, if, if, there, if G by E exists in truth and then you control for genes, does, is that maybe a, I mean, even then I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not totally, my, my intuition is that it shouldn't matter even in that case. Like, you know, you are getting average effects in, in both cases, average across um, genotype. But I think in expectation, you'll get the same parameter whether or not you control um, for the score. If G by E is real, then shouldn't you just put that in the model? If there's an interaction between the, the PTS and the intervention, then you probably want to put that in the model, right? I maybe. So, I mean, th like once once you once you interact a, a, an intervention with a polygenic score, you're you're making a lot of assumptions on top of that, and you may just you know you may just be interested in the average effect of the intervention, you know, because un unless you're planning to intervene conditional on a person's score, and you just want to say like what's you know let's say the intervention is is um, forcing people to stay in school an extra year, right? We may just be interested in okay, if we're going to implement a policy like a compulsory schooling law policy that raises how much education a person has. Um, but we plan to just do that across the whole population. Um, like the interaction's not that important because we're not going to. Would be good if that were Sure, sure. I mean, but it, but it follows the same rationale as like, okay, yeah, like it, the closer the estimated model, you know, if it includes the things that have like real effects, like yeah, we'll we'll see increases in precision. But like what we care about is kind of the average effect. How how is this intervention going to affect people on average in the population? Um, Patrick, just another point, I guess, and that is, you know, it's true that if you control for PGS in a randomized you know, experiment, you will decrease the standard errors, um, but that's not guaranteed in an observational study. It's right? definitely not guaranteed, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to clear that up. Yeah, yeah. So, so if, if the variable that you're, you know, that you're interested in is, um, you know, is correlated with the polygenic score, for, for some reason, and then you include it as a control variable. There's other crazy things that can happen, and so, um, so yeah, that's 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 an important point. So this is if you actually have random or quasi-random um, variation. I guess you can see it in your formula because you know it might decrease sigma squared e, but it might also decrease sigma squared x. So yeah, it just depends on the ratio of that. Mm -hmm. Whether the standard error goes up or down. That's right. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's talk quickly. Um, I, have, I have kind of four limitations that I want to discuss in two minutes. Um, so uh, the first limitation of polygenic scores is that we, we often don't really know like what they are. Like we we you know we we've talked about how complicated um, uh, how how you know how complicated heritability is, and polygenic scores are are just you know you should think of them the same way that we think about these heritability estimates. And so you know we don't really know. Uh, What's captured, and so as a result, you know, this goes back to this idea of using them in, in Mendelian randomization or, or IV um, settings. You know, you, you need strong assumptions about exactly how your instrument operates, um, and and if we don't know like what's going on or what the pathways are or kind of the the, the way it's getting from from gene to, to outcome, then it's really hard to justify the assumptions um, in like a structural model or an instrumental variable setting, and so. You know, so that's that's the difficulty the difficulty of these polygenic scores, and this is something that you know you'll see people on Twitter all the time saying, "I like, go, oh, what are these scores like? Who cares?" You know, this is the thing that they're worried about. I and they're they're like real smart people. This is a real problem that they're bringing up, and so you know you do need to be careful um, when you're using the polygenic score to to realize that this is a complicated thing that we don't understand. And there's there's a trade-off, right? So we could say let's just use you know a couple SNPs um, that are well understood. So like there's one SNP for smoking behavior that um, explains a lot of the variation and it's been carefully analyzed in like petri dishes and you know they've done a bunch of experiments and and, and i think that we sort of understand um, the mechanism by which this snip affects smoking but then if we wanted to add a you know but even that snip is not not it doesn't have a huge r squared so we may want to have a polygenic score for smoking and so we'll add more and more snips and as we continue adding snips um, we understand less and less and less, you know, because we start with the ones we know the most about, and by the time we add all SNPs in the genome, like who knows what those last SNPs are, are actually doing? Um, you know, 
this, this will get better and better as we study the polygenic scores. There's a lot of efforts to try to understand the mechanisms. Um, uh, you know, maybe we could make functionally partitioned polygenic scores. We could take a polygenic score that just uses SNPs that, you know, we understand to be involved in these mechanisms. Like things like that might be tricks to to help um, alleviate some of this, but but it's a hard problem. Um, Alicia's going to talk all about this, so I'm just going to say, you know, and someone even alluded to this earlier. Polygenic scores that are estimated in uh, European samples uh, or samples of European ancestry don't transfer well to populations of non-European ancestry. Um, and I'll let Alicia talk all about that. Um, there's, I added this as a, as a limitation two. It's, it's kind of similar to limitation one. Communication about polygenic scores is very hard. So not only is it hard to understand ourselves, but then communicating with the public um, is, is very diff difficult. You know? And due to all these critiques, you know, we talked about the, the Jenks and the Goldberger critique um, and things like that. For, for a lot of lay people and journalists, um, these, these subtle things are just not really well understood. And so you know, we're doing controversial research and we need to be able to talk to people about it. And if we're using polygenic scores, we need to be good about explaining these kinds of issues. Like you know, we need to understand them ourselves and then we need to get very good at explaining them to people. And so you know, I guess this is not a limitation, but it's something important um, to, to consider. I mean, there's even an issue of like, you know, the, the, Dan and I sometimes talk about how the word um, score may, may have a value judgment. Like, if I have a high score, like, am I better than you? <laughs> right? You know, and so it, it may be that, you know, we need to be careful with the language that, that we use. Um, the, the last one is, is what I, so, so we talked about the issue of, of bias, right? If there's bias in our polygenic score, so there's, there's two ways that stratification can really kill us with a polygenic score. Um, so one of them is in the discovery phase, right? So we do our big GWAS. If there is population stratification in our GWAS, then it means that our little B hats are, are going to be biased, and so that's going to cause problems for, for our polygenic score, you know, because we're, we're starting with, with um, incorrect weights, right? But I think that a lot of people um, don't realize that there's actually a second source of bias too. Let's pretend that we just did, you know, we, we, we got our data gods again who came to us and gave us the right unbiased little bees, and we used that to create our polygenic score in a prediction sample. Um, if our prediction sample um, is, has population stratification in it, then our polygenic scores will, will still be problematic. There still will be, bi you know, our, our scores will be stratified. And so when we're doing polygenic score analysis, we, you know, we need to include PCs. We need to do all of these things because the samples that we're predicting into um, may, may still have these, these stratification Would issues. Would that be true if you had the true polygenic score, though? Yeah, it is. No noise or whatever, like perfect score. It, it is true. But why? why? Um, in, um, so here's a super extreme example. Um, I, imagine um, that there's one causal SNP. And you have the true polygenic score, which is one SNP. But then in the prediction sample, you're stratified. And so it's, uh, you, you, know, you have one group where it has low allele frequency, another one that has high allele frequency. And so then you use the polygenic score in, in that prediction sample. You're going to capture just stratification effects rather than like true genetic effects for, for that polygenic score. Right? But it would also be capturing a real mean difference. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, like, yeah, there's, there is some. Sorry? Of the causal yeah, thing. But that's only yeah. if you're doing regression there. If you're predicting out of sample. But you care about prediction, not, then you don't have biased. to call it a bias. That's yeah, it's not biased. Sure, sure. If you're doing some sort of regression with the prediction yeah, yeah. in the, in yeah. the out of sample. So if you don't want to interpret the coefficient on the polygenic score as like, you know, in, in, in the causal way that we've been trying to talk about these sorts of things, then yeah, you're fine. Like if you just want to predict the thing, then you're good. But if if you then if you if you're actually interested in in the score and you want to understand what it's doing and, and things like that, um, then this it can cause you problems. Sure. Um, what's interesting is that the combination of these two things they can interact in in really um, awful ways. And so the problem is that uh, if there's bias that causes your betas to be large at sites where there's um, population differences. And then those are correlated with the LD patterns that exist in your prediction data, and then you multiply those together. This can can produce like really silly results. Where um, like one of the ways that they they saw that that they that they illustrated. Oh no, this is in Sini's paper in Finland. What they did is they took height polygenic scores, which which we talked about yesterday. It looks like there's maybe some stratification throughout them, and then they predicted the height differences between eastern and western Finland. 
And based on the polygenic scores, they, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they predicted the height differences between eastern and western fins to be several inches or... or yeah, I'll show the... Oh, Alicia's going to talk about it. But the reason that, you know, the, the, the combination of these two things together can, can work together to really exacerbate these problems that, that, um, that we're talking about. Um, I think that's, yeah, so that's, I think that's all I want to say. Are there questions before we, oh, there's lots of questions. Okay, quickly then, <laughs> sorry. Um, my question is about the p-value. So why are we using any uh, p-value when we construct the polygenic scores? So we are using just the beta, which is the effect size, right? Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that uh, the, the b, b hat, sorry, not the beta, the b hat are uh, more precisely estimated if the, the p-value is lower. Uh, but we are losing completely this information, so we are adding like lots of noise. Yeah, so kind of two, two points in response to that. If you do a pruning and thresholding score, you actually are using p-values because you're choosing your SNPs based on the p-values. And so, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, so if there's a low p-value, you're shrinking it to zero, and if there's a high p-value, you're like keeping it exactly the same thing. Um, for the Bayesian methods, I, I, you can't see it in, in the model that's that's here, but it turns out that we're doing a similar sort of thing. If we have a, a large b, but a big standard error, so so decreasing the p-value. Um, this Bayesian method will tend to shrink those towards zero a lot more aggressively than, than SNPs that are precisely estimated. This is just kind of a, a, a trick to, I mean, it, it just happens um, implicitly in, in the Bayesian approach. And so, yeah, so we, we actually, we do do that, just not, uh, not explicitly. Mm -hmm. This is uh, related to the question of like, the uses of these polygenic scores. Like you, you laid out quite a few of them. I, one of the things that I guess would be potentially concerning is precisely the idea that um, if you do something which has a social, a social behavioral phenotype, that you know, in an abuse of terminology, could lead to population stratification. Right? The idea of using polygenic scores to basically sort people out into certain groups of, in terms of policy, right? In, in terms of, because this really is also to communication. Um, so my my concern is with regard to the idea that if you do have um, these polygenic scores and you're trying to communicate exactly to say policymakers in terms of, isn't it better to also start to incorporate explicitly things like, um, for example, let me use an example actually. So when you did like PG <coughs> scores for educational attainment, so if you within the same population group, if you say um, looked at educational attainment amongst a certain group for, say, the Montessori system of education versus a traditional system of education, where what you're trying to say is that there's a gene um, mediation, a genetic mediation of, of environmental effects. So I guess my point is that in terms of both the communication and the layout of these research plans, would it help to have more environmental variables explicitly considered in addition to the genetic effects? so that it had a better, um, so that the interpretation, the communication for the policy makers would be better. So you're talking kind of about, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're thinking about G by E. So it may be that in different settings, genetic factors may have, have different, uh, different effects. And so it might be that the score that we're using, like this, the score is designed on just looking at mean differences, across, you know, average mean differences throughout the population. But we might be interested specifically in, well, how did, how did these differences change in different settings or in a, in a you know, Yeah, that's super important. Yeah. Um, and, and so Matt Keller is going to talk about G by E um, next week. Um, like the, the quick answer that I would say is that, you know, ideally we would have scores that, that you know, are interacted with the environmental variables and so that, you know, we have the score that corresponds to the model that we would like to, to use. Uh, but we have, we have a problem. We don't have enough data. You know, if we're interested specifically in a particular policy, like we, we can't, um, do you know implement that policy on a hundred thousand people and do a GWAS on them, and so but we, we do have these you know GWAS and and you know a million people and so we're going to have a thing that's not quite the right thing but it's a very precise thing and it's a very powerful thing and, and so that's that's the trade off, um, so so I agree if we had enough data uh, yes but we don't and so this is maybe as about as good as we can currently do. Yeah uh, yeah and then we'll come here. It, no, I was just going to mention that maybe another limitation that's very important that people often dismiss is, is the idea of like polygenic scores capture something about the environment. It, it's predetermined, but it's not exogenous. Yeah. yeah. 
Right, and I think that's maybe something that we're going to see later, Alex. Yeah, yeah, that's a... But I think that's a big limitation of current studies because we don't have familial genetic data. That's true. I probably should have at least added a teaser about that, but that's, that's very important. The scores, the scores also capture the genes that we inherited from our parents, yeah. and it's maybe correlated with the genes that our siblings have. And I guess it depends what the purpose is, right? Yeah. If the purpose is purely prediction, then... Oh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think this goes back to the discussion, yeah. the interaction between the two of you. I, I mean, it's very similar to one of your limitations. I forget if it was two or three. Like, but mm. clearly, it matters in a lot of application whether you're getting a, a lot of predictive power because, it's in part, because the score is just correlated with the, you know, environment uh, and, and in which you were raised. Mm -hmm. uh, and Alex's work suggests that's a source of concern for at least some uh, some phenotypes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So I have a question about prediction. So we're using these polygenic scores in independent samples, right? But quite often we have the sample overlap that we are not aware of. So are we going to discuss any methods that kind of help to control for that? So you know, people are increasingly part of 23andMe, and you know, mm -hmm. I'm part of 23andMe and the Estonian Genome Center, and you wouldn't know that, right? So yeah. No, that's. That's a great question. So, so the, the issue is that if, if your prediction sample includes individuals um, that are the same in your, in your discovery sample, um, that's going to create false inflation of the predictive power of your score just due to things like you know, overfitting, essentially. Um, and that's, that's really bad, given that a lot of our data come from sources like 23 I mean, we don't know who these people are, and they may be involved in a bunch of different cohorts. Or, or, or yeah, or even relatives, right? If your if your sibling signs up for 23andMe and you're in this other sample, like um, that's that's problematic. You th there are ways to de detect whether there's sample overlap between your discovery and prediction sample. So like you can use J Raymond's going to talk about bivariate LD score regression, um, and the intercept in bivariate LD score regression gives some indication of if there's um, sample overlap or relatedness overlap between. Um, between the two samples, I I don't know of ways to to fix the problem if there if there is overlap. Like if you see that there is, then you're just maybe in trouble, or you should try to figure out you figure out a way to remove the individuals that may be overlapping. Um, I mean that's that's would be the best thing if you can do it. Um, yeah, no, I agree, I agree. Um, that's a great point, and I don't I I don't know how to fix it. Um, at least I don't, I don't know of a way to fix it other than just doing the best you can to, to drop those individuals from discovery. Or from the replication, I suppose, if you can figure out who they are. Okay, we're over time, so we should stop. Um, uh, yeah, thanks. And you know, if you have other questions and stuff, we're going to have office hours later and other, other discussions, and so we'll have plenty of time.